Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the New Hampshire Archaeological Society 2021 Archaeology Month presentations. My name is Dick Bolver. I'm the secretary of the New Hampshire Archaeological Society. Today, we're excited to welcome Paul Oberheim, who will speak on his thesis research on tracing the movement of, of obsidian in Yellowstone National Park. Paul has been a volunteer in SCRAP since his senior year in high school, and he is now a graduate student at the University of Wyoming after graduating with a BA from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. So welcome, Paul. It's all yours. So hello, everyone. Uh, as Dick kindly introduced, I am Paul. And this presentation is both going to be a little bit about some of my time at SCRAP and what I'm currently working on at the University of Wyoming. And I've titled it Formulating a Thesis um, because it's not a full thesis presentation yet. It's going to go through a lot of the steps that I'd like to be <laughs> my thesis, but doesn't have that data or um, more scholarly quality to it. Uh, so the slides are gonna be about me during the beginning. And as we work through, um, it's going to go into my thesis, the background of where I'm looking at, which is the greater Yellowstone area, uh, my, the goals that I want to accomplish with my thesis and how it works into anthropology as a whole. A uh, little bit about me with some baby photos. Uh, I did start my senior year of high school um, with the scrap program. And I've been back and forth ever since um, really up until recently in COVID. Currently, I have a poster posted uh, for the Society of American Archaeology meeting, uh, which is all online on one of the sites uh, that was worked on with the scrap program. So if you're signed up or registered for that, you can actually check it out by either searching my name or uh, looking it up in the uh, general listings of posters. And uh, I'm still a member <laughs> and I love the bulletins that come out. And uh, so do my peers here at the University of Wyoming. Um, really good quality. A uh, couple of pictures from across the board on different scrap things. Uh, no, that's not me at Pillsbury. It's Mark, <laughs> the state archeologist. Uh, but, you know. Uh, so what I've been up to recently, uh, 2020 was really a wrench for a lot of people. Um, but I continued with my plans after undergraduate. Um, and I drove out here to Wyoming. Uh, I've gotten through most of the first year of my master's and I've recently been hired by the U S forest service, uh, to do post wildfire archeological survey and recovery in Northern California, um, which I'm preparing to leave to next week. Uh, I've had a few side projects come up here at the university of Wyoming that I would have liked to talk about as well, but given the other things that I've had to work on, they've, not warranted much of a presentation yet. Um, still learning about Wyoming weather. It snowed for the past three days and it was, you know, 70s before that. <laughs> uh, so everything here is on instruction. Uh, feedback is great. And I see that I'm having some Slight problems, sorry about that. There we go. Feedback is great. Uh, I appreciate any questions. I'll try my best to answer them because of the way the university does thesis work. I won't have hard data to answer some of the more science oriented questions with, but I do have my background research done, so should be able to do a lot with that. So the greater Yellowstone area possesses numerous obsidian resources. These resources have been well known throughout time as their use has been recorded from the late Pleistocene 
to after the first Europeans entered the American West. The goal of my thesis project is to measure the distribution of obsidian spatially through time and how it relates to population. Focusing on the distances from source to site, I'm aiming to look at sites with documented ages and the density of obsidian artifacts at these sites. Um, in doing so, I hope to see how direction, distance, and changes in population over time affect their distribution. This is going to be done using both the resources of the state of Wyoming and uh, the Yellowstone National Park System. And in case anyone is unsure exactly where Yellowstone is, it's up over here in this corner of Wyoming. And if down below, there's a little map that puts that in relation to the rest of the states. Uh, brief amount of background. So the, Yellow, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem or area, it's interchangeable depending on what you are referring to with it, all has a similar biome and extends kind of from Yellowstone at the core to a couple areas in the periphery of different forest lands. And it's variable in how it's depicted most of the time. And I'll have a couple graphs or maps that show you the general layout. Um, but the benefit of looking at this area is that there's plenty of obsidian resources there. Um, there's a very dense cluster of them due to all the geothermal activity and times long past. And it provides a perfect way to utilize uh, the University of Wyoming's new carbon 14 database um, to see how densities dated over different time periods change when you look through time because with the CARM-14 database, we're able to get an idea of how population changed through some of the other um, graduate students work here. And I'm going to be using that along with um, density measurements of the obsidian to tell how we see certain resources used and distributed over that time scale. Uh, so here is a general depiction of the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Uh, two different maps, one with a lot of different <laughs> labelings and one that's quite sparse. But as you can see, it kind of stretches across multiple states and extends in interesting ways. Um, all the Lighter green on the right, darker green on the left is forest service or protected land. And then the little extension that they give to it are areas that are not uh, federal or state that are more, that fit within the idea of what the ecosystem is, but not under um, the same jurisdiction. Uh, this is a little map of the different obsidian resources in the area. Uh, note the corner of Wyoming and how it has quite a few in a very tight cluster, which is why in looking at where the obsidian moves to from out of this area, I see as being especially significant, as it could be done with other resources, but obsidian makes it unique for a few reasons. And I'll get into that in a moment. Um, another map, same idea except... Um, post-contact era of the different obsidian resources used. And again, very tight cluster around that corner of Wyoming. So the general methodology for my thesis is to use the state archeological database, uh, Yellowstone National Parks archeology span records and the developing C14 database here um, to compare the ages and densities across time. And so my first step in this process is I'm going to establish the area I want to ga or gather data from. My current idea is to keep uh, density examinations to as far as an individual or group of indi individuals could move in about two days. Um, I won't be looking at quarry sites as they present too much material to look at, and it's not what I'm interested in. 
What I want to see is how the Obsidian changes in terms of how much are they bringing out from source to site in what direction. Um, as in doing so, I believe that we'll be better able or give us a new way of seeing how relations are being enacted without actually seeing those relations as through one period of time, you may see more obsidian moving south versus a different period heading uh, more west, let's say. Um, but in doing that, we'll be able to now take the carbon-14 population estimates and compare it. So maybe during a dip in, po in global population, we see obsidian move a different direction than it normally would. Um, but we can look at it more specific to the area I'm just referencing. Um, I assume that as you move further away from source to site, you'll see a drop off in overall density. Um, and I, it's, that, it's that graph or that scale in where that drops off and by how much is what I'm really interested in. So my next idea is or process step, I should say, is I only want to take um, data from sites that are datable. Um, as close as I can get it, I understand that dating methods sometimes leave a very large swath of time, but the more precise I can get it, the closer I can get it to the dates from the Carbon-14 database. And so knowing uh, that later sites will have more, um, they'll be more plentiful. Uh, I'm trying to stick within a general collection of each so I can, I can still graph a trend, but I won't be weighting my data too heavily to one period over the other. Although if I get a sufficient amount between a certain time scale and I can graph a trend with it, that would make me very happy. Uh, I know some obsidian that's been collected has already been tested with XRF, uh, which is a method of determining the chem chemical elements within an object and sourcing it from where it came from. I don't anticipate having the time for XRF. That's one of the things that's kind of a concern in my mind as I work out how I want my thesis to be formed, but I anticipate things being generally well documented enough or not being completely within the scope that I need to do XRF. And as there are some sources that are more located westward than say uh, eastward, what I plan to do is see how I plan to take the ranges that I previously discussed in the first slide and extend them to those different sources as to not say, well, of course we see more obsidian moving out west, there's more sources out west. I want to kind of push that as far as it can go um, before you see a significant drop off in obsidian and then see how much is continually moving. So after all those have been gathered, um, I'm going to take the both the information from the carbon-14 database and the work that's been done to determine population over time already in that area of Wyoming and put the two together. In doing this, I hope to see the trade relations over time. Uh, and this has to do with obsidian being the thing that I want to study. Why obsidian? Well, because it serves as more than just a utilitarian resource presents an opportunity to see something that is known to have been traded um, and how it moves, not just as an object of utility, but as an object that people want. And in doing that, relationships kind of form up. So I want to see those relations or see how those relations play out, try to see. Um, and I think this is a good way to do it. Just gotta get there. 
I've tried to work in the four-field anthropological approach to it so that it's not simply just an archaeology project and in thinking about what ideas from the other subfields I can put in, I've kind of come to this nice little flow chart. And archaeological, we've gone over a lot. Uh, cultural, I'm looking for those past connections and exchanges um, from something more than utility and how that could be brought to um, regional groups today. Linguistically, I'm seeing, <laughs> could be one word for it, how connections in language could be seen through this trade. Although linguistics has been a hard integration into this project so far, um, trying to fit it within good boundaries, but we'll see how it goes. And then for the biological component, uh, the greater Yellowstone area is very biodiverse and has more benefits than just lithic raw material. It presents advantages for um, settlement and diet. So as we look at the um, raises and lowers of population in that area, are the people living in that ecosystem still able to maintain these relations or do they cut back? Do we see a dip off at a certain point in time because maybe things are, maybe it's been a bad few seasons and the resources just can't be dedicated to something like that. Or because of the environment of Yellowstone, are they able to maintain their lifestyles where, whereas people outside of that ecosystem have to shift their priorities. So quick work wrapping up of things. Um, as I said before, I'd like to do XRF testing. I don't know how to work it in in a way that both fits my time constraints and makes sense for my overall goals. Um, I, I've hence changed, or I've since changed the my second point. I was originally thinking about being more centered on Obsidian Cliff, but as I thought about it and the great number of other obsidian quarries that are known, I've decided to take the more spread out approach and taking my idea of mapping that um, radius from source to site and just bringing it over to the different sources in the area. I also want to ensure that my project is unique. It's not, it, this, the idea of looking at obsidian um, in terms of how densities change over time is not a new idea. But the new concept is it a uh, new concept in it is using the carbon 14 database. And so I want to make sure I incorporate that in a meaningful way that makes it stand out from the rest of the other projects that have been on this. Um, and thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. I'm just going to skip by that because it's a work in progress. But yeah, thank you all very much. I thought, thank you for the instructions to unmute. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. I think everybody is required to do this uh, at least once. Um, so we've got some questions. Uh, the first one is sort of a baseline one. What makes Yellowstone Obsidian so special? Uh, what's it look like? Uh, there are different sources. How are they different? And how do they compare to the stones in New England? Well, the, the easiest way I can attack that is uh, obsidian is volcanic glass. So while the other sources in New England are a lot more, they have a lot more grain to them. Um, what makes obsidian special is how cleanly it breaks and um, how sharp it can get. It makes for both a very aesthetic uh, resource and a very, uh, one that requires a certain amount of skill, but has a high payoff. And so while the investment in it may be more for something, say, chert, uh, the results are usually more desirable. 
how the obsidian changes from the different locations uh, around Obsidian Cliff, like Wyoming Obsidian versus uh, Idahoan, I suppose would be Obsidian. I'm not 100% sure yet. Um, I'm sure they're different chemically because they've been XRF'd and mapped that this one's from this quarry, whereas one's from a different one. But considering they're all in the same geological range, I imagine there's not much variation between them out there, but got to be a little bit hesitant on that one. Uh, about the C14 database, um, first part of the question is how is it created? How is it established? And second, how do you get from C14 dates to estimating population size and density and so forth? How do you get from dates to numbers of people? But first, tell us about how the database was established. So the Carbon-14 database is a project that's been ongoing at the University of Wyoming, where they've been reaching out to different states and collecting all of their Carbon-14 dates um, and putting them in one place. And in doing that, you can see the different site amounts at different times all across the board, not just for Wyoming. Um, so Wyoming had its own before all this, but now it's at a state level. How population estimates can be gotten from that is I haven't, I've asked the person who's been working on it for their paper, so I hope I don't butcher it too much, but I believe that they are getting, they are seeing how many hertz or carbon-14 dates they can get from the different sites, and they are they see that during a certain time period, they're getting more like fires across the board versus others where they've seen a significant dip. So I believe that's how they're tracking population. But again, I'm not entirely sure. And I think it's very area-based. So in one archeological survey area, they're getting a lot of uh, hertz from one time period and they're able to get those dates and then show it on a graph versus maybe low in a different time period but then a couple thousand years down the line you see it shift and suddenly there's few there and more in a different area or less overall and because they have a database for this now they're able to see how those dates are spread out across the board In terms of tracking people moving around the landscape, uh, will you be using things like least cost pathways analysis, which is, comes out of GIS? Are you looking at that kind of, of analysis of, of movement? I would love to. Uh, that was actually my original idea with the project, what I wanted to really get into, as I figured a lot of the current uh, travel estimates were done uh, as the crow flies, as they say. And the more I got talking about implementing that, the more it seemed uh, tertiary to the overall goal. Uh, and there were doubts about how much uh, variation there would be in least cost pathways distance versus uh, straight travel distance in terms of expenditure or how far someone could get. So currently I'm not doing that, but I have been thinking about it. Um, Tom notes that uh, National Geographic uh, ran an article last year about Yellowstone archaeology. Uh, have you been involved in any archaeology in Yellowstone or from Yellowstone data uh, to date? Unfortunately, no, I have not, although I would have loved to, um, as I actually have uh, National Geographic articles that uh, issue in my house. Um, however, I am applying for a grant that will enable me to stay at Yellowstone for about a month or two months in order to gather data from there and be in contact with people who are more directly involved with the Yellowstone archaeology, as I feel that would greatly improve the work that I'm trying to do.
You mentioned that you've been uh, tinkering with ideas for other kinds of projects along the way, things you haven't gotten into yet. Give us an idea of what else is of interest to you as a, a budding graduate student. <laughs> well, uh, I found myself in a very odd position with nothing to do about midway through this semester, which I should have been grateful for. But, you know, at the time, it felt like a little bit of a of a burden not to do anything. So I wanted to get out and in doing so, I went and talked to some of the professors and one mentioned that they had a collection of uh, equally sized sticks that were found wrapped in twine and bark that was also wrapped in twine um, from the same location, different uh, elevation from a cliff. And so I was asked if I could figure out the nature of the sticks. And so I have books on games um, of uh, indigenous peoples in the area. And I also have books on pertaining to ritual of the indigenous peoples of the area. But other than having a few things bookmarked and uh, some of the data collected, I haven't been able to do anything yet from the sticks. Uh, so it's it's been that project that's in a file on my computer and something that I really want to get to. But then things got busy again, as they do with getting accepted to go work in California and realizing I needed to get a lot of my other work done early. When you go to Yellowstone uh, this summer, uh, what do you hope to, uh, to do there? What, if everything went uh, just the way you wanted, what would it, lo what would it look like? Well, hopefully if I get um, the Yellowstone grant accepted, I would spend, I would write it and apply in the fall, and then I would spend my time next spring. Um, just having access to their collections, I anticipate running into the issue where I will encounter sites that I really want to use for my project that have been really well dated, maybe even XRF'd, but the densities might be unrecorded for some reason, or maybe their projects really on the, or sites on the fringe that got very little attention um, that I want to reinvigorate and say, okay, this is near quite a few sources. Let's see if I can get an XRF test on this. Um, just being in the environment where I want to write and uh, don't have to worry about emailing or having a meeting and can get my hands directly into the collections would, um, would help fill out my data a lot more. We have things here at the University of Wyoming, but I know that Yellowstone has their own repository and they also have connections to the other um, uh, collections from Montana and Idaho, which I'd have to consider in my thesis project because the, uh, the obsidian areas kind of cross over to those two different states which means that they have information that I also have to look at. I expect that you'll be doing an awful lot of uh, research over uh, the uh, archeological literature from not only Wyoming, but the adjacent states. Will you be uh, having to go to um, those other states to uh, get into their uh, archives? Uh, will you have to rely upon it was available uh, electronically? Uh, how are you going to uh, bite off that part of the, the, uh, uh, the research? If you're going to be looking at where it's traveling to, up in that corner, it's going to have to be going into the other states. And the people back then didn't realize they'd gone into Idaho. <laughs> there were no potatoes to look at. Yeah. Um, uh, just to give some perspective, uh, where I am right, where the University of Wyoming is in Laramie, it's about a six or seven hour drive out to Yellowstone. Um, so in just being there and having the peace of mind that I can work on my thesis for a month or two and have a place to live, I'll also be a lot closer to the different repositories in Idaho and Montana, um, which would help me with that. But if I can't get there Physically, I'm going to have to rely on contacting those institutions and just getting what they have. Hopefully it turns out to be serendipitous as other people have worked on projects of a similar scale before. 
but in the event that it's not, I'm going to have to reevaluate how I'm looking at directions. And maybe I can only look at south and west instead of all of them. At which point I'd have to reevaluate what my questions are because now I can't get a full scope of what I really wanted to ask. So do we have any other questions out there from the audience? People must be sitting there musing about something. Uh, in the meantime, um, tell me more about the different kinds of obsidian in Yellowstone. I know this is like a half a dozen different sources. Are they visually distinctive? Are they uh, distinctive only in terms of XRF or some other uh, uh, petrochemistry? Um, you know, what's the, the range of variation, shall we say, for obsidian in your target area? From what I have inquired here at the university and what I've seen, they seem to just follow the general black to grayish to a little streaks of white that you tend to see in obsidian. Uh, the collection that we have here is obsidian from Yellowstone. And I've only seen very slight visual distinctions. Um, not to say that major ones don't exist. That's just not something I've encountered yet. Although, chemically, I think, yeah, I'm unsure just because I haven't gotten to work with them yet, but I wish I had a better answer for how they differ under XRF analysis. No, they do. Just not sure exactly how. So I imagine then you'll be spending a good deal of ramping up time uh, identifying what are the characteristics of the obsidian sources. And I think also you're going to have to figure out how the archaeological reporting has said it's this obsidian versus that obsidian and how reliable that would be. Uh, yeah. How will you approach those kinds of problems? I think it's going to be quite a bit of lab time. <laughs> um, the reason why I'm kind of staying away from XRF is because I feel the general goals of my project could be accomplished in just looking at how far the densities drift from the source that we know out walking distance wise. If they got it from one quarry versus another um, that are in close proximity, I don't see it as being that different because the general idea is that I'm seeing maybe there's a lot going this way and then very little's going this way. So even though there may be distinctions in where exactly it's coming from, it's more in how we see it drifting out one way versus the other way. It's known that not a lot makes its way more westward from Yellowstone, but perhaps there's a period of time where you see a more of an influx of that. In looking at the XRF of it, I then start to consider, okay, we have a piece from Obsidian Cliff that we see now all the way out in Idaho, for instance. Why do we see that? Um, does it, it have any different particular meanings or did they favor it for some reason? But I'm more looking at it as a source of maintaining a relationship or a system of gift exchange over whether or not um, it comes from one particular place. For a PhD, <laughs> I think I'd spend more time on that as well as it would answer more questions. You've got uh, quite a broad range of potential questions. Uh, as you get into it, you may need to uh, pare it down. If you only had to pick one or two aspects of all the things that you've outlined, which would be the ones you th would like to follow and which ones do you think would be uh, most likely to give you new data that no one else has, has seen yet? Oh, that's, that's the trick of it. <sighs> I, I, do, I do tend to general, I, I think big and then I always have to work backwards to something smaller. 
if I had to narrow it down, I think I'd look specifically at Obsidian Cliff Obsidian, which is kind of what I was looking at originally, which would involve XRF. Um, and of course, that comes with all the other questions you asked before. But I think in looking at that specific Obsidian's movement, the questions would be toned down where I'm not looking at all these different places. I'm only looking at one. And it would just require me to be able to verify it, where it came from. And if I couldn't verify, how do I address that in the rest of my thesis? I could still use the Carbon-14 database and the population estimates for uh, that area of Wyoming over time, but it, would, it wouldn't it would be as full, I think. I think it would leave a lot up to, well, that's just one source. Maybe things get more regionalized. Maybe in the West, you don't, you see it more, whereas out, you see, um, the obsidian drift off because they have their own sources. It's uh, it's a little bit of a balancing act with problems, but I'm thankful that I have both opportunities like this and opportunities with my advisor to keep talking about it. Um, I actually, I wish I could show you, I have a cork board off screen um, that I developed in January in order to map the progress of my thesis. And it started out with one little book page like tiny notebook page asking a question and has since developed into many larger pages with a lot more details on how that question actually works out so it, it's very satisfying to see linear linearly how a question develops but it's also a little bit tricky because as each new thing you add you have a whole nother slew of things to consider and so it, it quickly Branch, branches isn't even the right word. It more bushes out like a massive hedge. <laughs> Just everything's cluttered and messy, but through it, something will come. And that's the conceptualization process. I think we call that exponential expansion. <laughs> it's um, certainly not anything I'd ever like to graph. <laughs> um, shifting uh, to the West, uh, you mentioned that you're going to be working in California. Tell us... Uh, what uh, will be occupying your time uh, with the Forest Service in California? Uh, I'm curious. I, I anticipate a lot of work with a thimble, thrimble, the little GPS unit. Um, and I know that one of the first things they want us to do is to survey all the campsites that have been affected by the wildfires last year uh, so that we can assess if there's any archaeological material and how to best handle that so that campers can return to using national forest land. After that, I think it's going to be myself and a team of about five or seven others uh, in various locations of the park going about the land. They've been very general <laughs> with me, which is a little bit scary considering that uh, I think they're just gonna use me for just about anything that they can think of archeologically. <laughs> You gotta have a wide skill set. <laughs> they mentioned bear spray. They haven't mentioned it yet, but I have some living in Wyoming, so it might it might make the trek to California with me, especially since I anticipate a couple of nights in a tent. Um, it was really interesting at first. They they proposed to me the idea: How would you like to stay in a compound thirty minutes outside of town? And I thought. Wow, <laughs> what an opportunity to be bear bait. <laughs> <laughs> hmm, okay. Uh, and oh, uh, Tom asks, uh, do you think you'll ever get back uh, to uh, New Hampshire and dig uh, Pillsbury State Park or Bear Brook or, or something else like that? Uh, what, what's the chances we'll get to see you in person again? I'd absolutely love to. Um, it won't be this summer, unfortunately. But it, always, it shocks me how short a master's program is because as you've seen from my presentation, I have a lot up in the air and apparently it's all supposed to be done by this time next year, they tell me, uh, which I think is ludicrous, but apparently it works out. Um, so if all goes well and I end up graduating on time, which I anticipate I will, 
hopefully I'll have a little bit of a gap over my summer and I don't jump directly in, into work where I can come back home and, you know, say hi to family, friends, and leave immediately to go to New Hampshire to, to get somewhere else. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, it's been uh, really good talking with you, and uh, you certainly have uh, the field wide open for your master's research. Uh, we'll be interested to see uh, what surfaces from it and uh, watch you on your journey. And uh, uh, we do appreciate you uh, uh, doing this. Um, so to, to close it out, we, we do want to thank you. Uh, really enjoyed talking with you.